What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 340. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources, and joining me on the line all the way from Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. LSV, how goes, sir? It's going well. It's going well. You doing good? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, ready to talk about some Eternal Masters. Yeah, we're going to get into Eternal Masters. We're going to be doing kind of a rundown primer type show. This is, uh, you know, a compromise, right? Um, You know, we've had a few people ask, hey, are you guys going to do a a card-by-card set review for Eternal Masters? And we don't usually do those for these. And the reasoning is pretty straightforward, is that we assume that the majority of our listenership is not going to get to draft Eternal Masters a whole lot of times. It's pretty pricey to play. And, uh, you know, most I think most of our listeners are going to do it between zero and one times. And, uh, you know, doing a full card by card set review is a big lift. And so what we decided to do instead is to go over the set from a big picture perspective and get you set up for what the archetypes look like. So when you sit down to draft, you're not just sitting there clueless. You have a few key cards in mind so that, you know, if I'm in these two colors and I can go that direction and get you set up for that. So that's what we're going to do on the show this week. Before we get into that, of course, I want to remind you, limited resources brought to you by channelfireball.com. You can go there for awesome free content. I know that's when when I was uh, when when Channel Fireball first came out, that's why I went there. I was like, "Oh, I'm going to read all these sweet articles by luminaries like John Laux, for example." Remember when John wrote he for you? He was one of the original writers for Channel Fireball. He was, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I remember, you know, cuz he was a local player. I didn't actually know him yet uh, personally, but you know, I would read stuff from him and and a bunch of others. And of course, that stable has expanded out into some of the best players in the world. Uh, they make draft videos. You can find, uh, you know, constructed content on there as well as far as videos, articles, everything over there at CFB. And while you're there, hey, you might need some singles to fill out a deck. Maybe you want some sealed product. Maybe you want some Eternal Masters to do a draft with your friends at home. You're going to find it at Channel Fireball as well as, and this is kind of exciting stuff, you can get uh, limited resources gear there. You can find LR t-shirts and you can also find deck boxes and sleeves, all limited resources, and uh, they're all in stock there at Channel Fireball. Also, you can support the show directly via the Patreon. That is patreon.com slash limited resources. It's really easy. You go there, you get set up, you pick an amount, and it will take that much from you each time we post a show. You can set a limit on it. You can stop at any time you want. It's completely optional, and you get some pretty cool bonuses uh, for, for being a patron. One of them You get to ask questions. So you put a question in the question of the week thread, and we'll pick one per week. This one comes from Michael uh, Rodden, who says, Recently on the Magic the Prothorine podcast, Jerry Thompson says that he thinks limited formats of Magic are in decline. Do you agree? And if so, what do you think could be done to stop it? And this is something that I I find really fascinating, Luis, because I hear this a lot uh, from my friends who are professional Magic players. Um, you know, talking about the good old days and when it was a skill game and when things were different. Um, and it's funny because for me, having come back to the game, you know, around 2008 in that range, um, you know, I think that for me, I don't really think I ever experienced what that was like. Uh, the, the, the limited landscape has changed significantly since I came back primarily with regards to removal, what rarity it's at, how cheap and effective it is. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been pretty happy with limited since I came back. Now you have been playing the game a lot longer than I have. So what what is your take on it? Do you, do you think that limited is in decline? That's not the word I would use. Uh, the limited formats that I would say that I, I got into magic with. Yeah. You, you don't see those anymore. You're not going to see, you know, actually the flashback set this week is, is Lorwyn. If you even want to see mm. one of the, the more recent sets and they're the ones from 2008. So eight years at mm. this point, Lorwyn, yeah. Has a bunch of cards at common that would never you'd never see at common these days. It's a silver gill dowser, one one that taps to give a creature minus x minus zero, where x is equal to the number of merfolk and fairies you control. So it's a common, it's a one one. Your opponent sits there and has, not only has to count the number of merfolk you have, but also the number of fairies you have, and it just it lets them attack their three three and your three three, and then you just like give their three three minus two minus zero, and all of a sudden you just chump attacked. Like right. you just don't see that kind of stuff anymore, at least not very often, and. I don't think that it makes it worse that we're not in that world anymore. I mean, I think it makes it it makes it makes harder for better players to win at the win rates they used to win when those things were around because those cards like that and formats that were really complicated and had a lot of efficient removal and had a lot of ways to get card advantage tended to favor very invested players, but I don't I don't I don't think that it limited is in decline because that's not how it, how it works anymore. If I was looking at the last 5 years of limited, I would say that we've had a pretty good run. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I've 
certainly enjoyed it. But again, I don't really have those those super old sets to compare against. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'd like them better. I, I, I guess ignorance is bliss in this case for me because I've been pretty happy with it. Um, crack a pack. Let's get into a crack a pack. Unfortunately, Eternal Masters has not been released at the time of this recording, so we can't crack an Eternal Masters pack. Um, but maybe we'll we'll sprinkle in a couple of those into future shows um, just to for fun. Um, so we've got a Shadows Over Innistrad uh, pack here, though. So let's uh, let's do that right now, Luis. I, I think you have the pack. I I didn't bring any to Vegas, so I'm yeah. What's what's this? Here. We I, I've got yeah. The pack. Uh, <laughs> hey, I never got that Sin Prodder, by the way. So it's sitting right here did on you, my desk. Did you steal it from a from a listener? I did not. It's right here, r- w- along with a Duskwatch Recruiter, which might be an even more desirable card. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, for this week, we'll start out with Soberline Snapper. Uh, the 6-6 six, six for 6. There. Now, I saw a very popular professional Magic player actually play two of those in a deck on their stream uh, fairly recently. Does that mean that the card's good? Um, that player was me, and <laughs> my deck was bad. <laughs> Your so deck was funny. <laughs> I, I'm not going to say that it was it was uh, the card I really wanted to have, but it, it did its job. Either way, we're not taking it early, and uh, I, I, would not, no, I not. would not advocate playing the card under normal circumstances. So... I'm going to go ahead and move on to Vessel of Ephemera, the White Vessel. It makes two one on flyers. Never been super impressed by this card. Um, I always want to be, but I I, just I play it, I would say, more than it. half the time, but I never take it highly. So it's a sort of card where I don't mind having it in my deck, and I think it fills a role, which is to get an enchantment into graveyard. Giving you two one ones is good in a deck with equipment, but mm-hmm. uh, I would not, I would not uh, advocate taking it early. No. What about the blue vessel, Vessel of Paramnesia? No, that one's even lower on my list. No, I have not actually put this in the deck yet. Yeah, it's it, it does something that's reasonable, but it just turns out that there's better ways to do it and you don't need to pick a card like this. Uh, next up, we've got Hound of the Far Bogs, another card which I've played recently on stream. You know, I, I, I'm no, just you're testing on a real the cards. Heater. I'm testing the cards to make sure that we don't end up uh, dismissing cards we think are bad. Oh, you're going through the, the bottom of the barrel just making sure we didn't overlook something. Good for you. Good work ethic. Yep. But no, Hand of the Farbog's not not a pick here and not a card. I, I think maybe I've played it either zero or one times. So I don't like the card at all. Yep. Uh, next up, we've got Shard of Broken Glass, the equipment that gives plus one plus zero and mills for two when you attack. Another card I don't like. Yeah, it's still this is just another, too low impact for me, man. I just I can't get it. The the ways this makes this my deck are number one, I have Abyssinian Missionaries in my deck, and I, and I want an equipment. Uh, number two, I have three or four good Delirium cards, and I'm really short on actual good Delirium enablers. So mm. neither of those situations are ones that happen all that often. Yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna pass on Shard of Broken Glass. Next up, we've got Gone Missing, the five mana bounce spell, which I'm not a huge fan of either. God, I'm not either. But, and, and, yeah, and, I mean, but, it's but, more but, than a bounce spell. It puts it on top of their library. Yeah. Gets, like, it's a powerful spell, like, as you get the clue out of it, too. But it's so slow, and, and being a sorcery is pretty brutal, too. Yeah, so I'm going to say Gone Missing is not our pick. Next up, we've got Watcher on the Web. 2-5, Reach, blocks everything. Man, you know, it's funny. It's probably the best card we've gotten. Oh, it's but, the pick right now. Yeah, but, but it's uh, still not very good. But like, it's not great. Not as a first uh, pick. Next up, we've got Vampire Noble, 3-mana, three 3-2. Three, so. Dude, step up your game. All right, all right. What about Halpack Wolf? Can I interest you in a 3-mana, three 3-3? Three, three? Yes, that is a card I like. I, I find the downside to be not that bad, especially in green-red. And if I'm looking to turn creatures sideways, you can mitigate that downside even further. And uh, I like that card. That that would be the pick uh, for me at this point. All right, I'm gonna I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm probably taking Halpack Wolf over Watcher on the Web. I was actually a lot higher on Watcher when it first came out, but I... I I have found it's just to be just mediocre. Agree. Uh, we've got Liliana's Indignation as our first uncommon, the X spell that mills yourself for X and makes them lose two life for each creature. You know, I think you and I are going, uh, you know, end line to end line with that one. We never liked it at the beginning and, and it hasn't gone up for me as well. I haven't actually found a situation where I'd like to have the card either. You know, you you did a good job with the Shard of Broken Glass outlining you know, when you would want it, even if generally you wouldn't want it. And for some reason with, with that card, I haven't even found a spot where I would. Ooh, we did it though. Uh, Ooh. we're actually getting there. Oh. Ongoing investigation. Is oh, next uncommon. This is one of the premier uncommons in the set. And actually one of the, one of the better cards in the set. I, you know, whenever you do when one or more of your creatures damages them, you investigate and you can exile a creature from your graveyard to investigate. So the combination of those two abilities means if they don't block your creatures, you get a bunch of clues you know, one, one per turn. Mm -hmm. If they do block your creatures or creatures die, presumably trade, and then you exile them and get another clue. So 
Yeah, Ongoing the, investigation is pretty great. Yeah, the only downside to that card when you well, not the only, but the major downside to it when you look at it is that you know it does cost blue to cast and green to activate, and it really is only in that mythic rare, uh, mythic uncommon status when you can activate it, when you can pay the one and a green to get it going, because that's how you get the second half of what Luis said. So that that is the consideration: is uh, I got to make sure that that I can splash this or that my primary colors are blue and green. But yeah, beyond that, it's the most powerful card in the pack i'm definitely uh, number one on my list right now well one good thing that mitigates what you said there is i've had success with this card in a base blue deck that just has one or two green sources so mm-hmm. like yeah you red, can do that r- red blue with like a dual land or something like that yeah and, I, i've had success with it too but I, I have found it to be much much less better you know than when i can activate it like right. basically it's a card that like if you can set up a profitable attack situation while being down a card uh, you know, for casting that that doesn't doesn't do anything when you cast it, then you're good to go. Then it, then it's great. But I really like it when you can consistently activate it and just like trade a creature off, right? And then just start the chain going, gaining life, getting more clues, and and kind of going forward like that. Uh, so the next uncommon we have is malevolent whispers. This threaten that with madness, you can steal one of their creatures and give it plus two plus zero. Oh. I think this is good. no. I think it's yeah. It, that, that was a useful whisper, though. Uh, I'm going to say <laughs> ongoing investigation still to pick. Yeah. Uh, our flip card is Village Messenger, the one on haste that flips into a two-two menace, which a playable card. Yeah, uh, I think so too. If you're if you're looking to be really aggressive, I think the card holds its own. That said, it, I don't think it holds a candle to uh, to ongoing investigation. It doesn't, and uh, it does. Uh, I see what you did there. I have the card right in front of me, so I can see the, <laughs> I can see the the, the 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 candle it's holding. All right, so. <laughs> Our rare is interesting, though. Our, our, our rare, more uh, accurately, our mythic rare, is a Ooh. card I think a lot of people would be tempted to take over ongoing investigation. We've got Nahiri the Harbinger. Ooh. That's a good one. Huh. So this is the Planeswalker. She's two, a white and a red, four loyalty, plus two, you may discard a card. If you do draw a card, minus two, exile target enchantment, tapped artifact, or tapped creature. Well, you can put me in that camp, Luis. I am definitely tempted to take that card over ongoing investigation, and and I would. I I would take Nahiri over ongoing investigation. I, I I have played with Nahiri in limited, and while she isn't in that you know rare rare air of like one of the best planeswalkers ever, planeswalkers are usually good in limited almost regardless of their ability. There's a few exceptions, but they're very rare. Uh, well, they're mythic rare, I guess. And but th- but Nahiri's actually just good in limited. Like I've I've definitely been able to position board states where I can use her as removal, protect her, tick her up. She has a ton of loyalty. She can get through your deck and find you your cards. And she is a pure gold card, which is a legit downside. But I consider ongoing investigation, you know, three quarters of a gold card or something. And and I do think that Nahiri is is legitimately excellent. So I, I would actually take Nahiri here. All right, I would still snap up ongoing investigation. Uh, how, cl- I- how close is it for you? It's close, but okay. I it, it it's funny. So this is a bit of a tangent, but one of the things that when it comes up in debate uh, is how useful it is to say that's not close. Because a yeah. lot of people, especially when you're talking about magic, are like, it, it's ongoing investigation, not close, or it's Nahiri, not close. And it's yeah. like, well – how useful is that really? So and that, you hear me ask that all the time. How close yeah. is it for you? Because like yeah. I can accept that you that maybe it's the right pick, but I, I want to know like is is this a nail biter for you or is it a big gap? Because that's where the interesting discussion. So it's happen. not a big gap. Like I don't think it's horrendous to take Nahiri, but it's the but the next the next stage of of its of the of it being close or not close is it's close but clear. As in, <laughs> mm, mm-hmm. I, I would I would take on the investigation. I'm not I'm not like waffling. But I don't think that it's unreasonable to take me here. I think it is close. Interesting. So, All right. It well, is close but clear for me. I'm going to take on. Yeah, I'll. I'll uh, I'm really curious to hear what other people would take. This is one of the closest cracker packs we've had in a really long time. I think. Uh, but yeah, I think I'm on Team Nahiri for this one. I do think it's close as well. If if you were to like put both of those cards face down and flip a coin, I'd be like, I'm winning either way. I, I you know, as far as that coin flip goes. So. Well, cool. the listeners cool. are, are, are – whoever wins this is winning either way because well, Nahiri is, 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 a, actually is a like sought-after card. Give it to me or something. But well, we'll see about that. You know. <laughs> OK. Cool. Crack a pack. That was a good one. Uh, let's get into it. Um, I want to I kind of cruise through the uh, the Eternal Masters 
you know, overview here. So the, the first thing that, that we should do is, is mention what Eternal Masters is. And uh, we have mentioned this, but I'll keep it brief, which is Eternal Masters is comprised is a new set comprised comp- entirely of reprints. And it will be familiar to people that have played modern masters, vintage masters, these type of uh, these type of sets where they take all reprints and then they make a new set out of them. Uh, you know, it seems to be that the main purpose of them is to get uh, sought after cards in the hands of players, but they also make sure that you have fun doing it. Like Wizards isn't just going to like throw a bunch of random cards in a pack with some really bomb mythic wares and be like, here, buy these packs. They know that you want an experience for it. And so what they're doing instead is they've set up an entire draft format around it. And what you do is, you know, you're an R&D and you're a developer. You get to just use this huge swath of cards to choose from to make a really cool format. And what we see is they will pretty consistently break things down into color pairs. And the color pairs will each get sort of an identity to them. And you see this in regular draft, like in Shadows. You know, you can – there's a few color pairs you could be like, oh, I'm red, black – vampires or whatever. And then some of them are a little bit more muddied and you'll see that here too. So what we're going to do for this is we're going to go over the big picture implications on what Eternal Masters is about, how you should draft it, how you should approach it fundamentally. And then we're going to hit a little quickly on each of the color pairs to give you an overview of what it's trying to do and some of the key cards that you'll want to look out for uh, if you do end up drafting that deck. Uh, so so let's get into it. Um, Luis, let's talk about uh, big picture stuff for, for Eternal Masters. Sounds, sounds good. Now, well, one note, which I think is kind of funny, is when, like you said, the set is designed, right? It, it is designed to be a draft experience. Yeah. It's designed to be a cohesive set. It's it's funny because on the one hand, you don't have to make new cards. So mm. the design team is not, all right, let's create new cards, which in in some ways is easier, right? You're not having you, – you, it's not limitless possibilities. Like you actually just know what you have to work with. On the other hand, you don't get to make new cards. So it means when you have like – a hole in the set that really needs this perfect effect you have to you have to find a, an existing card to, to slot in there so it's just a kind of it's a different design challenge than a, a normal set would. yeah for so. sure and and it's really i you can see it play out like if you look at the set and I, i'm sure once we start drafting it you can see like oh i see what they did and there's some pretty cool challenges for them that we'll uh, we'll address here okay so big picture here Luis. um how, how should people approach eternal masters like you know, is it just like any other limited format? That, that's the kind of question I think that people are going to have. Well, the, the biggest difference between any of the the master sets is in in limited in normal limited is that we're we're much closer to cube than we are to Shadows Over Innistrad or Konzatar Kier or or Magic Origins, whatever normal set you're thinking of. Mm-hmm. And that was true of Vintage Masters. It was true of Modern Masters, and it's true of Modern Masters 2015. Yeah, which 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 what that means is that. You're going to be building constructed decks, and, and constructed decks. I don't mean you every every card has to exactly fit in this particular archetype. You're you know, and every deck's going to be broken. What I mean is that your decks are going to be much more heavily themed. You, you you're going to see a lot more of well, these are the ten two color pairs. They have these like pretty they have these pretty robust themes. And and when you're you know when you're uh, something like black green, if you're not in the black green theme, then you probably shouldn't have been in black green because it, the the pile of good cards decks are just not going to win. And that's what a normal limited deck is, right? Yes. Most normal limited decks are piles of good cards like they or, 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 or medium cards, depending. Uh, yeah. They, I mean, they have, they have themes. It's not like delirium decks don't have a theme or like the blue red spells deck doesn't have a theme, but four mana, four, four, you're going to play in all your limited decks in normal formats. Yeah, and, totally. And, and, and you know, Three mana or four mana kill a creature is is something that you are is like sought after, like Oblivion Strike. Mm-hmm. But when when we're talking about the decks here, we're talking about decks that each card is designed to do a specific thing. Each card is is trying to achieve your goal, and you're playing very few just like generic good cards. I mean, you're going to play the the actual good cards. You're always going to play. You're going to play Swords to Plowshares and all your white decks. But your 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 deck is supposed to be an engine. It's supposed to be a machine. It's not. It's not supposed to look like a normal limited deck. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that you'll see as you go through the set is you're going to I mean, I think that most of our listeners, I know you and I do this automatically, Luis, is we, we grade the cards, right? Like not necessarily like with the with the grading on the grading scale, but you're looking at it like that's a great card. That's a good card. That's an excellent card. And it's interesting because it's tempting to look at those cards especially in the environment in which they were originally printed. If you happen to have played, you know, limited in that format and be like, oh, that card's a bomb, right? That card's just amazing. Or it's a super premium common or uncommon. And you really want to get a bunch of those. But the the kind of rising tide 
you know, raising all ships or whatever is, is really prevalent here. You actually need to adjust your grading scale upwards pretty significantly because cards that are really good, you know, in older formats are kind of the baseline here, right? I mean, we're talking about some of the cards that, you know, Gravedigger, right? Mana Wars in this set, you know, as another example. And these are the type of cards that in a regular limited format really catch your eye. You're like, ooh, a Mana War, ooh, a Gravedigger, right? Like these are two for ones. These are cards right. that, that can really Separatist go Separatist Void Mage, four mana Mana War was the best or one of the best blue commons. Yeah, in right. And and now you get a, you know, you shave an entire mana off, which is a big deal for that type of effect. Again, Gravedigger is very commonly a, a, a two for one and, and, a, and a solid play. And basically any limited format it's been printed in. But these are actually closer to average rather than premium because you're getting absurd cards here, right? I mean, they're picking from sets that go back all the way through magic here. So you're getting, you know, deep analysis is in this set, four mana, draw two cards, and then you can flash it back from your graveyard to draw two more. It's like, you know, you're getting a lot of cards out of that. You've got cards like Firebolt, which can kill two creatures pretty easily. Uh, Necrotal. Right. That's the original. They call them, you know, that enters a battlefield, kills a creature, creature, uh, you know, so you get a two one first strike for four mana and it also kills a creature when it enters the battlefield. Swords to plowshares, maybe the best removal spell of all time. It's on the short list. Right. Factor fiction. I mean, hello. <laughs> I, I, have, I have four swords to plowshares in my vintage deck right now. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, I mean, it's just absurd. So, you know, and, and these cards are cards you're going to see draft in and draft out. These aren't mythics. You know, we're not right. talking about cards here that are not going to show up. Yeah, and and you just have to readjust, like you you know again you have to recalibrate because if you, you're going to be anchored by the cards that you've already that you've already you already know are good, but just remember this this kind of goes back to even the same as the first point, which is decks are better, cards are better, and mm-hmm. and you have to be ready to to play with these and against these these cards and and not overvalue cards that you knew were good from before, which actually leads us to the next point, which is that the best cards are actually just absurd. Like if you were to make yes. like you know, limited's greatest hits, like cards like Mother Runes. I mean, I, I actually did play originally the format where that card was an uncommon. That's a Ugh. one white for a one one tap tar- creature you control gets protection from any color. It's the most like, annoying card ever. <laughs> once once Mother Runes is in play, you your opponent can't attack or block or use any removal spells. <laughs> yes, that's exactly so, it. So. You know, and, and then there's Jace the Mind Sculptor. Uh, like, Control Magic is not even, like, the best card in the set or one of them, but it's still very, very good. And when you get Control Magic, uh, it's so, like, you, your 4-4 four, four all of a sudden becomes their 4-4. Four, four. So when you're when you're looking at cards like, like this, you just have to remember that a normal limited format, yes, the best Mythics are going to be really good. You know, Archangel Ivison's very good in Innistrad, but there's just, like, 20 Archangel Ivisons in this set or, or more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's also interesting to see that raw power level, you know, comes into play here. But also, you can get, uh, you know, mythics and and super, you know, and and rares that go specifically in your archetype that are absolute bombs for you, and maybe not for for other people. But again, you know, we we raise the the bar on the commons and uncommons. That bar gets raised on the on the rares and mythic rares. If, if in fact, oftentimes even higher. Um, next card advantage. Yeah, it, it's funny when I was looking through the whole set to try to figure out what was going on. It, you know, it, again, it's just like the bird's eye view. All the cards I kept thinking, wow, that card's really good. It's like, wow, Factor Fiction, Deep Analysis, Merfolk Looter. Like, and it, it, and the re- and it's not just because I like drawing cards. Obviously, I like drawing cards. But I, you know, there's an actual thing here. Even outside of blue, you know, there are a lot of ways to get card advantage, like Grave Digger and Him to Turok in black or, or Firebolt yeah. even in red. So Harmonizing Green, for example. So... Card advantage is really important in formats with really high power levels, and this is something you see in cube all the time. Again, cube is, I think, the, the closest. If you were to pick a format you played before, cube is probably like one of the closer thing, closer analogs, or, or if you played Vintage Masters, for example. Mm-hmm. And when there's a lot of efficient removal, we're back in the days of, you know, we're back where there's one mana removal spells. There is Swords to Plowshares. There is Necrotal, which is two for one and very efficient. And card advantage just gets better in those worlds when when people have a lot of ways to kill your stuff and a lot of really powerful cards. Card advantage is just just scales very nicely. So you 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 should look to be really ag- aggressively taking card advantage. And the color combos that are light on card advantage tend to be more aggressive. So yes, you might not have as much card advantage if you're like red white or red green, but you should be beating down to to make up for that. So for sure. It, 
if you're if you're playing a, anything that could be described as mid range or control, and you don't have a lot of ways to get be up cards, not even just little card draw cards like Necrotol also work here. You're, you're going to be in trouble because you're going to play against someone who also has good cards and is just going to draw four more cards than you over the course of the game. It's going to be very hard to beat that. Yeah, and the cards they're going to draw are going to be awesome, and it's not going to look good for you. Um, rarity shifts. This is something that comes up not very often in regular uh, draft just because it has to be a reprint and then they usually won't do too many rarity shifts. But a rarity shift is something is, is a tool that the developers can use when they make a set like this to uh, make the set look and act more like how they want it to. And what they do is they'll take a card that was, let's say, a common or excuse me, an uncommon when it was printed originally and they'll make it a common. And it'll show up as often as a common shows up in a set of this size. And Elvis Vanguard used to be a rare. There you go. Yeah, they they're, they're literally will shift rares down to common. It's insane. And it's so easy to overlook that and just be like, oh, yeah, I remember that card. It's good. You know, I'll, I'll look for those or whatever. But you put, put it in your head as, oh, it was good at an uncommon. It's common now. And all of a sudden, you're going to see these things popping up. Now, the ones to really pay attention for, in my mind aren't just the power level ones. The power level ones are important and you'll be like, oh, wow, that's crazy. That's a common now. But it's the ones like the card that you just mentioned, Elvish Vanguard. Cards that are kind of dying to be built around or that go in a synergy deck that used to be common. Therefore, the developer at the time thought in their head, okay, well, we want people to have access to this sort of payoff type card for this linear deck, but we don't want them to have too many. Uh, so we're going to put it at uncommon and, and, and power it up accordingly. Well, when you bump that down to common, now you can have four or five of these things, right? And if that's a type of card that can, you know, be the linchpin for a build around deck, then that's the kind of card that you're going to want to really pay attention to because you know that they did that for a reason. You know that they took that thing down to a common because they wanted to push this archetype. And that might be the type of card that you really want to slam when you're going for a really linear deck. So we'll try to mention those. But, you know, when you look it up, you can also just, you know, use magiccards.info or whatever to, to check it out. And you'll see that there's actually quite a few rarity shifts in the set. Yeah, and, and it, it that kind of go, also goes back to the you know, adjusting your scale when you, you, you're, I think it will be easy for people to look at a card that used to be rare or uncommon. That's now a common mm -hmm. and consequently overvalue it. What the, the previous rarity doesn't really matter. The previous, well, I mean, it's, it's a clue though, right? Yeah, it, it, it is a clue, but what I'm saying is don't let that bias you too much. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Like there are rares from previous sets that, that would be bad commons now. For sure, and, totally. And th this set doesn't have very many of them, but it, it is it is just it, it being aware of rarity shifts is good. But I, I just am worried about people taking it to the other too much the other direction. Fair like, enough. Like you can move a rare down to an uncommon, and factor pictures is just going to be better still. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Likewise, Mother of Runes got moved up to rare, as did a couple other uh, cards. Yeah, that's in, not in the that only day. one. There, there's a few that did that did go up in rarity. Uh, I think Wasteland is no longer an uncommon, <laughs> for example. Um, okay, uh, one last point to make before we get into the two color pairs. And this is something that I think is really, really important, which are anytime you have a, a, a format that has a lot of uh, linear, high synergy type decks, there's going to be cards that can fit into multiple versions of those. Uh, sorry, I should say multiple different archetypes. And these are really important because these are the cards that you'll find that you don't get as often as the rest. You know, uh, we've seen this time and time again. You know, let's take Modern Masters, the original one, as, as an example, which is like, let's say you're drafting the Affinity deck. That was an artifact deck. It wanted as many artifacts in the deck as possible for these payoff cards. Well, the cool part about drafting a deck like that is that if you're the one doing it, nobody else wants the payoff cards. So all of a sudden, you can start taking raw power level cards in your color and then wheeling or getting a little bit later down the pack these payoff cards that the other decks are, have no interest in. But you need to know what those cards are. Um, you, there's a few pretty good examples. I mean, Merfolk Looter is one you had here, Luis. I mean, that, that card it just in any blue deck is fantastic. It doesn't really matter, you know, what you're trying to do. That card just tends to overperform. Yeah, it, identifying the cards that cross the streams, as it were, yeah. uh, is, is super important because mm -hmm. you don't want to you don't want to do a draft and end up where you end up five picks down one direction, then realize you're, that that direction is closed off because that's going to happen more in this set than it will in a normal set. There you because go. you could you could take five green cards in a row, thinking that you're going to draft like white green enchantments, and then realize 
wow, I'm actually gonna, I'm actually need need to draft red green beats in this seat, and maybe the rancor can like transfer over, but a lot of the other cards won't, and mm-hmm. you're and you're gonna be, have tossed you know a lot of equity out the window, but. I, I think that there are trying to find the cards that are not only powerful but also flexible. And the reason that's difficult, and the reason we specifically bring it up, is because because we've been saying this is a linear format. You don't want to end up with random generic good card in your deck. You want to end up with either a great card or a card that fits your theme. Merfolk looters. I think the best example in the set of a card that perfectly nails a bunch of like the themes while just being a great card uh, as long as you're willing to use it in situations where it's good to use it. Yeah. And there's other examples. We'll try to highlight those, but I do encourage you at home to also look for those yourself. Try to see the cards that would be like, you know, this would go in this blue deck or that blue deck. Another one that that came to mind we mentioned earlier was deep analysis, right? There's some graveyard based decks here, right? Where you're going to end up with deep analysis in the graveyard incidentally where, where it's excellent. And then there's also some you know, more card draw style decks that just want to play a deep analysis just because it can draw so many cards. And I think that uh, realizing that these cards are like uh, often splashable as well, like deep analysis, I think is a card that I would not be surprised to see you splash. Agreed. Okay, let's get into the color pairs now, Luis. We're going to kind of just try to touch on these. We don't want to go super deep, but we just wanted to, again, just get your sea legs under you uh, before you, you sit down to draft. And so we're going to go through all of them. There's 10 of them here, so it will take a little little bit of time. But um, again, we want to just sort of familiarize you with what each one does and then set you free upon the world to uh, to draft Eternal. So the first one we're going to start with is blue-white. And as you might imagine... It does stick to the sort of traditional blue-white role, which is Flyers. It's a, it's a blue-white Flyers and Tempo deck. And I think the card that jumps to mind for me that that really hammers this home is Mistral Charger, which is one and a white for a Pegasus. It's a 2-1 with flying. So it's a two-mana, two-powered Flyer, which is already quite good. And here, right off the bat, Luis, we have an, uh, an example of a rarity-shifted card where the Mistral Charger and its original printing and dissension was at uncommon, but in this set, it's actually a common. So you're going to see quite a few of these things, and uh, you can you can grab them and start beating down. Now, that's not the only card, but you know that's the sort of cheap, uh, aggressive flyer that can really put a lot of pressure on your opponent early and reward you for the tempo plays down the line. You know, Mistral Charger is exactly what this deck wants. Uh, this deck also has... At common, uh, not a flyer, but one of the one of the uh, the more underrated cards in the set. I can already tell <laughs> uh-huh. uh, because it all it always was before, and it's not been in print for over ten years, actually fifteen years now. Collision Honor Guard. Oh, don't it's, even say that to me, man. Oh, uh, it's three and a white for a two Ugh. four, and it's a flag bearer, and it says that whenever an opponent pl- activates an ability or plays a spell that could target a flag bearer, they must target at least one flag bearer. So. It's it's the kind of card that doesn't like it doesn't look uh, as insane as it actually is, and I, I can I I have played against this card. It is and with it, it is absurd. This Basically, is the most infuriating magic card ever printed. It is they, so annoying. They, anything, they have to target it. I mean, they, they have to target at least one flag bearer if able. So if you, if they have a multi target spell, they can choose it as one of the targets. Yes. But so here's what it does: it protects all your other creatures from removal. If they have any, like, lightning bolt or three damage or less removal, they're all blanked because this is a 2-4. They're blanked. Like, they can fire it off. They have to target the honor guard. It doesn't kill the honor guard. <laughs> no. And they're not forced to play the spell. They just no. are not going to be able to play it because it wouldn't do anything. It, it turns off all pump spells. It turns off cards like Rancor or all enchantments. Like, imagine you're playing the green-white aura deck and you're like, oh, God, these Rancors and Ancestral Masks. And it's like, well, you got to put them on my honor guard. Uh <laughs> Honor Guard is is absurd. I wouldn't be surprised if this was like, if not the best white common, because I guess pacifism is also pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might be it, 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 it's in the running. It, like, it, on, Coalition Honor Guard, it just it just messes up your opponent's game plan so much. Yeah, I mean, look and think about it in in just the the easiest case scenario, right? You play a couple of flyers, right? It's maybe a couple of Mistral Chargers, so you got four power in the air. Remember, it's a common. You you could have a couple. Then you play a Coalition Honor Guard. If your opponent doesn't have any way to kill it, then your flyers are going to be protected for a really long time. If they do, they cannot kill one of your flyers with their removal. They must use their first piece of removal on Coalition Honor Guard. Now, you think, okay, well, that's kind of annoying. But you look back at most limited, and it's like, 
Do you always just have two pieces of removal in your hand? No, sometimes you just have one and you really need to kill a flyer with it so that you don't get beaten down in the air. And this thing's just going to suck up that removal spell if it kills it even. And remember, some of them don't even like pacifism doesn't even get the job done against this stupid card. And it'll just sit there laughing at them. It It is unreal. The first time I ever played against this card, Luis, I just ran like three things into it. Just like. I just kept forgetting it was there or under, I didn't really understand how it worked. I'm like, what do you, I just had to pick it up and read it like every single time. And yeah, the card is completely uh, busted. And it's also just a good blocker on the ground at two, four, um, you know, which, which is a good thing when you're trying to get it in the air. Um, another card that I'm particularly looking forward to playing in blue white flyers is man of war. My favorite magic card is in this set. And uh, you know, it's not my favorite for no reason, right? I, the, the card's very, very good. It, it does a lot of things against a lot of different decks. It's a fantastic tempo play that lets you build out your board while setting your opponent back, and it can be really hard for them to come back from that. It can chump block or trade on the ground while your flyers get in. It knocks off, you know, auras and, and that kind of thing, and it's just a just an excellent addition to a card like this. So that's what you want to be doing with a flyer deck. Look for the cheap evasive threats, and then look for the solid white removal. Look for the coalition honor cards. Do not look past those. If you see those and you're in this deck, there's not going to be a ton of cards at the common level and maybe even the uncommon level that you're going to want more than that that coalition honor guard. So that's it for, for blue-white flyers. And I want to take a look to, mm-hmm. at, for every deck, I mean, we haven't played with the set, so that's not out yet, but our initial, like, our initial like grade of the deck or rating of the deck. Yeah, I, like, I, yeah. I, I think blue-white flyers seems solid. This do, it seems not, very medium to me. Yeah, it's not leaping out to me as great, but it it seems like you're not going to go too wrong with this because there's the the quality of the card. But this is kind of the deck I was warning against, where you this is this looks like a more of a limited deck. Like Agreed. You're, play, you're playing evasive creatures and some ways to stop them from killing your creatures or bounce spells. That's fine, but I, I feel like a, a good blue white flyers deck would lose to a good like you know blue black or red blue deck. So. I think so too. I, I think that the ceiling on this deck is not as high as you would like. But the floor is pretty good, and I, I think it's going to earn some victories. But, yeah, I don't think it's going to end up being, like, necessarily just the best deck. Uh, let's move on to blue-black now, Luis. What's the what's the blue-black deck in this set? So the blue-black is – it's funny because it's it's reanimator is one of the themes, though all the good reanimation spells are uncommon. <laughs> yes. Uh, but it also is just like kind of like a value deck that involves the graveyard. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's got – you know, the, the ever present Merfolk looter is one of the most important cards. And it's got like cards like Animate Dead and Victimize are both reanimation spells. And it's got just good, you know, removal spells. It's got, you know, cards like Frexian Rager and Frexian Gargantua, these like can't open creatures or or even more. And then cards like Counterspell and Deep Analysis. So it's kind of playing like blue black control, where it's just trying to draw a bunch of extra cards and get value, but also has these this reanimation theme where sometimes you're cheating things into the graveyard and, and animating them for cheap or or getting back creatures with uh, you know enter the battlefield abilities a bunch of times. Yeah, and you know the thing to look forward to for that is, you know, what's your like what I look for in a in a um, reanimation deck is what can I get back, right? Like what's you know, and, and that's gonna be rare dependent or whatever. Um, but the other thing that I, that I look for is what's my backup plan. And it usually ends up being some type of, uh, you know, blue, black control deck of some sort, right? you know, and so that's fine. I mean, that, that, that's a real, you know, that's a real thing that, that you'll want to, to look at, but there's a lot of, you know, decent removal in black. There's the card draw. There's maybe some evasive threats or some way to finish the game in blue. Um, so keep that in mind as you're drafting it that, yeah, the most powerful thing you can do is, you know, Merfolk looter, ditch something huge, use reanimate dead to get it back. That's going to be over the top of a lot of the decks that you're going to face, but you are going to want a backup plan in case that thing gets swords to plowshares or in case you don't put the pieces together correctly. Um, you do want to have some other way to win the game and maybe you can kind of, you know, fit in a reanimator package into the blue black deck as a, as a result. This feels a little more like a blue black deck that sometimes reanimates things than a reanimator deck. Kind of does to me too. And I got to admit this deck in modern masters was beyond atrocious. I think blue black may have been last place. So yeah, I'm not saying that's the same thing because these are just different card sets, but the, again, we've got, uh, this feels like a more unthemed deck than I would like. Like if you do get three reanimation spells and three discard outlets, like, you know, you have Plague Witch at Common, which lets you discard a card to give a creature mm-hmm. minus one, minus one, that sort of thing. Yeah. Then I could see it, it doing something 
really, really broken or big, right? Like when you're reanimating a six drop or a seven drop on turn three, like or, that's awesome. Or a nine drop, Inkwell Leviathan's in this set. Yeah, for there we go. You know. uh, that, yeah, that's great. So mm-hmm. if you're leaning hard on that, that seems good. But it seems like most of the time you're just going to be kind of set up as like a blue-black value deck. And I'm just a little skeptical that that's going to be great. But yeah, Deep Analysis, Necrotal, Merfolk, Literally, these are all great cards. So maybe you'll be fine. Yeah, I might just try to value people out. You get all those sweet card draw and the two-for-ones and stuff. And, you know, that that can be a good deck too. Um, also, no shame in animating dead a, uh, a, a Man of War. Um, Black Red. This, Black- yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Black Red is kind of the the theme we've seen in a lot of different Black Red decks over the years, which is a sacrifice theme. Yes. Yeah. We, we, I remember in Modern Masters 1, it was Goblins, right? Which actually did have a sacrifice sub-theme. But this one's very much more along the sacrifice end of things. So you're going to get some pretty, some pretty impressive cards uh, for this type of archetype. Uh, this deck looks to me like a little bit more of the uh, aggressive style, sac- you know, sacrifice deck, like... There are a few, I don't know how to describe them, a value sacrifice deck that exists in some formats, but this one seems a little bit different than that. For example, you get Carrion Feeder at Common, which is black for a 1-1. It's a zombie. It can't block. And you can sacrifice a creature to put a plus one, plus one counter on it. And then like out of red, you get a card like Mog War Marshal, for example, which is one and a red for a 1-1 that brings a 1-1 red goblin with it. And it's got Echo for one of a red. And if it dies, you get a 1-1 red. So when it enters a battlefield or dies, you get a 1-1. So Carrion Feeder on turn one, Mog War Marshal on turn two, you have two creatures right there. You sack both of them. The Carrion Feeder is a 3-3. Then you get a token from your Mog War Marshal. Sack that, and it's a 4-4 attacking on turn two. Like, that is yikes, right? Like, there's a lot. There's not that many decks that are going to, you know, shrug that off. They're going to gonna, they're gonna take 4, 8, or 12 damage from the Carrion Feeder before they can get their feet under them if they don't have a removal spell and a good one you know, very, very quickly. So this does seem to be kind of the the more, like I said, the more aggressive version. But interestingly as well, it does have some pretty powerful ways to finish the game in the mid to late game. The one that stood out to me, Luis, the most was Blood Artist, which is a card that just looks so underwhelming on first read and per- overperforms in such a huge way when you actually play with it. It's one in a black for an O1 vampire. Whenever it or another creature dies, that's anything. Uh, Target player loses a life and you gain a life. So it drains them. So, you know, if you can work that into my equation from before, all of a sudden, like you're up four life, they're down or up three life, they're down three life and you're attacking for a bunch and, and, and you can set up these kind of inevitability situations with blood artist. If you have a nice big board and a sacrifice outlet. One really key part to this deck is a dragon egg actually. Uh, Oh yeah. It's a common right now. And it's two to red for a zero two defender. And when it dies, you get a two two red dragon with flying that has fire breathing. You can pay a red to give it plus one plus zero. Wow, that's so very it, good. It gives you a creature to feed to your your sacrifice effects and gives you a two two fire breather, which can hit for four or five in the air. So wow, getting and that that's common, common is pretty big. Yeah. yeah, it used to be the, uncommon. The one thing this deck is missing, and the one thing that really makes me skeptical that this is 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 the best deck either, is that there's no threaten effect. Oh, that's huge. So threaten effects, you know, the temporary steal effects is like the bread and butter of the sacrifice deck because you steal their creature, you hit them with it, and then you sacrifice it. But there's just there is no threatened deck in the in in the red card pile here. Okay, well that's very interesting to note, and that does definitely limit the power level of the deck unless you. I, can I kind get of assumed there would else. be, and I checked twice just to make sure. Yeah, wow, that's yeah, that's definitely something. Deck looks powerful. Um, I I do have it though in that middle ground camp uh you know with the blue white flyers and stuff like it's hard again we haven't played the set so it's hard to say because you know you don't have a good feel for what the frequency of cards that are really important to this deck will come up with but again this type of deck that can do powerful things that has a cool game plan you know you even get cards like tragic slip which you can turn on you know it's black mana for an instant creature gets minus one minus one until end of turn but if morbid if a creature had died this turn it gets minus 13 minus 13 until end of turn instead so you know you can pretty easily turn on your tragic slips and use it to kill whatever you know would be blocking you um, so there is some some really nice, efficient, high power level things that you can do. But again, I, this this deck just still doesn't seem to be doing anything super broken to me. Yeah, I think without a threaten effect, uh, it, it, it's really not going to hit the the highest level. Uh, Red green beats is next, and man, this deck absolutely embodies the uh, the idea of beating down. It's a fast aggro deck that has well, it it has a slew of of powerful. Uh, attacking cards a card you know for example would be like flint hoof boards one in a green for a two two but if you can 
uh, if you control a mountain, it gets plus one, plus one. So it's a three, three for two mana, and you can pay red to give it haste until in a turn. This is the kind of card that can pile up a lot of damage very, very quickly. Um, other cards, Keldon Marauders, two mana for a three, three. Um, when it enters the battlefield, or enters or leaves the battlefield, it does damage to your opponent. It does. Excuse it only me. sticks C- around for a C- turn. But. Yeah, yeah. And Kurt Ape is the one that Kurt I was Ape. kind of saving Marshall, for the <laughs> for the big. That was my big finale. Okay, I was All I was right. setting I, up I was for the Kurt Ape. About Kurt Ape to let you. Yeah, yeah. To, 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 Kurt Ape really right though is <laughs> it is the, the the crux of this whole deck in my mind. Yeah, it's a, it's a one mana two three. Yeah, it's a one mana two three, and. I'm assuming that this is the only deck that wants it in the format. Like you're not right, splashing that, for I mean, it or you're whatever. You're not splashing it. The fact that you get a one mana two three, it's because it's a you know one one that gets plus one plus two if you control a forest at common means that and you're the only person at the table if you're the only red green deck who wants it. Like you get two two curd apes, three curd apes, and that would be insane. Yeah, that's a completely insane. This deck also has the ability to finish off the game with cards like Keldon Champion. Uh, Reckless Charge, Rancor, Elephant Guide gives it the ability to really pack a huge punch and pile on the damage as quickly as possible. And you can even play cards like Fervent Cathar, the 2-1 the for 2 and a red with haste, and when it enters the battlefield, target creature can't block this turn. Like, that isn't an amazing card, but when all you need to do is hit one more time, uh, that's the kind of card that can be responsible for getting in for five or six extra damage that you wouldn't be able to get in before. So this looks to me like if you're an aggro player, I think this is probably the deck that you'd want to start off with because every card in it just screams, beat my opponent over the head with a stick. It is just a very aggressive, very straightforward deck. I, you know, I'm kind of liking red green. I, yeah. I, may, I mean, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong here because it it is not, doing anything particularly broken, but the fact that it gets Kurt Ape and no one else wants it, the fact that Keldon Champion and Flint of Boar and Rancor and Reckless Charge are so good for this deck. Also, Fervent Cathar at Common, the 2-1 that makes their guy unable to block is just, you know, Haste is just exactly what this deck wants. It feels like this deck could beat the decks that aren't getting there, like the decks that aren't doing broken things pretty easily. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, also, I really like the fact that you get Two of your better cards that we mentioned here, the uh, Flint Hoof Boar and the Curt Ape, they're only for you. Nobody else wants that, those cards at all. So you can get a ton of Curt Apes and, and any of the Flint Hoof Boars that are open at the table and focus your picks on powerful burn spells, cards like Rancor that other cards also, or other decks also want, but that go well in your deck. I, I think this deck has a lot of punch. It's going to be pretty good too. All right. Now this next one, Luis, Green White Enchantments. S- sounds perfect. Okay, yeah. Okay. This one's a little different, different. right? And now we're starting to get into like, uh, you know, a, a few decks that are a little less straightforward here. Um, what do you what do you think about green white enchantments? How does the deck work? So the 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 plan here is to use cards like Yavamai Enchantress, which is like a two two that gets plus plus one for each enchantment. Uh, Ancestral Mask gives a creature plus two plus two for each enchantment you control. And Monk Idealist, when you play it, it gets back an enchantment from your graveyard three mm-hmm. mana two two. And just stack up a bunch of enchantments. There's a bunch of different common and uncommon enchantments. Uh, Rancor is just going to be one of the best ones regardless. Mm-hmm. If you're lucky enough to open uh, the uh, Mythic Rare Argothian Enchantress, then I guess you can play that too. There you but go. Uh, for the most part, you're going to, you know, obviously limited decks are built around the commons and uncommons. This is kind of like a version of the Green White Boggles deck where you're just trying to like stack a bunch of enchantments, make something gigantic with some amount of card advantage built in there. Yeah. I mean, it. I mean, Elephant Guide at Common is huge. That card is so good. Yes, that card is absolutely crazy. Faith's Fetters uh, is in the set. You know, yeah. it tends Faith to be Fetters one of the better removal Fism spells. Yeah. Give this remo- removal spells that still count as enchantments, which mm-hmm. is pretty big. And you get, I don't know if I'd call them freebies, but you get cards like Abundant Growth. You know, it's green mana for an enchant land. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card, and the enchanted land has tap, add one a mana of any mana of any color to your mana pool. It doesn't ramp you or anything. It fixes your mana a little, but it's very, very cheap, very low, low cost, abundant growth. It's basically impossible to get blown out by it and you get your card back. You know, th- this is an easy way to pile up a bunch of, of of enchantments on the battlefield and and maybe, you know, to take advantage if you have a bunch of Yavamaya Enchantress, which again is is a common, you know, and, and th- there's just little subtleties here, I think, that you can use to... Uh, you know, to, to power out a bunch of enchantments. I, I don't know how good this deck is. To me, it doesn't jump out as a as a super powerful deck. It seems to have a reasonable game plan, but I I don't love this deck uh, in comparison with some of the stuff that we've seen already. One of the things that makes me more most skeptical about the deck is you're trying to put a bunch of enchantments on a creature. We're playing a deck full of removal spells and no, bounce spells. Kidding. 
there's like pacifisms and mana wars and necrotals. Really? So I I don't really buy it. I mean, I understand how this deck could come together, but my inclination is to avoid it. It just it doesn't seem like your main game plan matches up well against the main game plan of most other people. This next one is I it's my early it's it's the early front runner for my favorite deck in the format. Have you never drafted it, right? This is just like a a prediction that has no real Your basis, favorite? You mean your second favorite? What's my first favorite? The blue red flashback deck. Well, we haven't gotten to that yet. Yeah, I'm just saying. You're, I you're, said you're, early front run, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait till we get there. Uh, black white is a blink deck. It's a, it's a, it's kind of a value blink deck, if you will. And and what we mean by that are, you know, uh, enters the battlefield effects on creatures, which you'll see a ton of in this set, way more than you would in a, in a normal limited set uh, that you can reuse. So blinking a creature is, you know using an effect to have it leave the battlefield and then re-enter the battlefield. And even occasionally with this deck, you're just going to bounce it back to your own hand, return it to your hand some way so that you can replay it and get another enters the battlefield trigger off of it. And there's some really cool stuff that you can do in this set uh, with these type of cards. You know, one of the cards that's sort of the headliner, I think, for enabling this type of strategy is a card like Glimmer Point Stag, which is two white white for a three three vigilance. It happens to be an elk, which I think is sweet. But when it enters the battlefield, we, we know we we know why you brought yes. this up as, as, we, as the key card. <laughs> when it enters the battlefield, you exile another target permanent, return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. Now you can use this flexibly to bounce your opponent or to you know. Uh, blink your opponent's things to get a blocker out of the way or to knock an enchantment off of something or whatever. But you can also target your own creatures in your own uh, permanents that, that can then reenter the battlefield and, and net you an additional trigger, which I think, I think can be a pretty big deal on some of the payoff cards that we have in the set. For example, two of the ones that I particularly like are Wall of Omens, one in a white for an 04 defender. And when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. So if you were to blink that, you get to just draw an extra card. Phyrexian Rager, similar, it's two and a black for a 2-2, two, two, and when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card and you lose a life. But again, if you were to blink that, like with a Glimmer Point Stag or whatever, then you're going to draw an extra card off of it, you're going to get the creature back, and, and things sort of start You can build your own 4-mana 3-3 three, three draw card. Hey, 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 I like that. I, I, I kind of like doing things the hard way. Another one that, that really stands out to me is a card that's easy to overlook but can really do a lot of work. Luis is uh, Avon Rift Watcher, which is mm -hmm. two and a white for a 2-3 flying bird rebel soldier. When it enters a battlefield or leaves a battlefield, you gain two life. Now, that just seems like too good to be true, but it has vanishing three. So it enters a battlefield with three time counters on it. At the beginning of your upkeep, you take one of them off. And uh, when the last one is removed, you have to sacrifice the Rift Watcher. But here's the deal. If you blink it, it resets that vanishing back up to three again. I mean, if you get to have an even Rift Watcher for, for six turns and you've gained eight life off of it total, like – that's the game. I mean, you know, I'm not saying you're going to win the game, but for effectively you're going to have that card for the whole game. And so if you can blink or bounce an even Rift Watcher a few times, it's a good attacker, it's a good blocker, and the life gain is is no joke as well. So the payoffs definitely seem to be here uh, for this deck, and I, I like it. I just think it looks powerful and it looks pretty good too. So this is one I have my eye on early as a, as a favorite. I don't know. I, I, I you're, understand you're what you're, you're, you're going for, but this just doesn't feel like it does anything. Most of the interactions yeah. you're describing are like ways to draw an extra card. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> I know, right? It's so awesome. Which, yeah, I mean, I get it. Like, that, that's sweet too. But like I, 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 I'm more into decks that do proactive things. Oh, no. And, Who are you? Who have you become? Okay, look. All I'm saying is that if I want to draw a bunch of cards, I'll just cast Deep Analysis. I'm not gonna, like, <laughs> yeah, or Factor I'm not, Fiction. <laughs> I'm not going to play a two mana zero four and then a couple oh, turns man. later play a white main line and then replay my two mana zero four. I'll just cast my my draw two and then move on with my life. So, can I, can I interest you in white main lioning a Calciderm? No, not really. <laughs> I, I, I played with, I played with the That's the dirtiest the thing illegal. ever. <laughs> is, is, is it uh. even – is it even the dirtless thing ever? Like you're I mean, attacking them with a five five. It's pretty <laughs> bad. I don't know. I'm just saying, like that, that I haven't set my sights very high, right? <laughs> when I just want to get my calciderm back again for a few more turns. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I, you're off it, but I love it. Yeah, I I, I think that uh, the next deck, the one I, is the one I really want to talk about. All right, let's the get blue, into that. Blue, the blue red flashback. Deck. Oh yeah, so, this one's sweet. It's headlined by Burning Vengeance for sure. This is the enchantment that whenever you play a spell from your graveyard, it does two damage to anything. Uh, 
And it's got retrace cards like Una's Grace and Flame Jab to work with uh, the Learning Vengeance as well as flashback cards like the aforementioned Deep Analysis, uh, Dream Twist, Desperate Ravings. Desper- Desperate Ravings is a common now. Mm. Uh, Merfolk Looter is great in this deck. Quiet Speculation is actually interesting too. You can just go put some retrace cards and flashback cards in your graveyard. Um, what is you got what does quiet speculation do? I mean I one in a, one, one a blue uh sorcery, just search your own deck for three three cards, put them into your graveyard. Three flashback cards, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, which which is really cool. And you mentioned uh retrace, which lets you play oh, right, a card. It can't from get your retrace cards, sorry. No, no, it can't uh, get retrace. But but you can get re- but retrace is in this set, you know, and that lets you uh you know, play a card from your graveyard as an additional cost if you have to discard a, a land from your hand, but like whatever. You you Burning Vengeance, thank God, whoever designed Burning Vengeance back in Innistrad looked far enough ahead to know it could have easily said whenever you flash back a spell or whatever it, it, it triggers, but it's just cast a spell from your graveyard. And uh now we have two different mechanics in this set that lets you do that. How sweet is that? So my big concern with this deck is if it doesn't have Burning Vengeance, it yeah. does look like one of those, you know, it sits there spinning its wheels type decks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Where, the classic LSV deck. Yeah, the, the, I mean, this is what I was talking about with the Black White deck. It seems like the Black White deck just does that always, whereas this deck, at least if it has Burning Vengeance, it just ends the game really quickly. Mm-hmm. That's true. But if it doesn't have Burning Vengeance, I guess... Casting flame jabs and dream twists seems a little anemic. <laughs> no, it's not very good. Yeah. Um, you know, the way I would view this deck is, yes, there there is like a blue-red, um, you know, flashback thing. But I, I just view this as a Burning Vengeance deck. Like I'm drafting this deck if I open or get past a Burning Vengeance and then get lucky enough to like especially get the second one, then I'm just totally in on this. If I don't, I'm I'm – I'll, I'll let you draft all the pieces and, and you know, whiff on the Burning Vengeance or whatever. By the way, Burning Vengeance isn't uncommon again in this set as well. So you're not going to just see them all over the place. It, and, you know, I, I think we, it, it is worth clarifying that if the two colors you're drafting are open and you get a bunch of good cards of those color, I think any color combination can be pretty good. Good point. Uh, yep. except, maybe, except maybe green white. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably just uh, going to get just, just destroyed God, by green I hope white. I'm going to do like three of these drafts in a row. And just yeah. And then you're gonna you're gonna join the good guys and start white manning, lining your baby oh, yeah, lift that's, watchers that's like happened. the best of them. <laughs> All right, let's, let's move on to black green elves. We've got. Yep. Uh, well, an elf deck. I mean, you've got a lot of elf build arounds. You know, you've got Listen on a Hunt Master, Listen on a on a Scarblade. So it's a Hunt Master is a four mana three three that whenever you play an elf spell, you get a one one elf. Elf, yeah. And then the Scarblade lets you discard an elf to give minus X minus X to to target creature or X number of elves you have. Yes. So you end up uh being able to generate a lot of elves, kill your kill your opponent's creatures. It it actually plays pretty well with cards like Gravedigger because you're discarding or, or having your important elves killed. And then, you know, the fact that it has Lanor Elves and Blight Soil Druid, just two, two mana acceleration elves, is a pretty big game too. Yeah. You know, one of the things I look for with decks like this, Luis, are like, it's it's easy to pick out the cards that are really good. And there are a ton. We, we're we only mentioning the ones that are like common. There's some really good stuff. Um, is, is it Imperius Perfect? Maybe that's not in well, the set. Imperius There's... Perfect is now a rare. So, yeah, But it is in the set, right? It is. It's yeah. two and a green for a two two. All your elves are plus plus one, and then green tap put a plus one one elf token into play. Which yeah, is which is a two thank two. God, it's a rare because it was an uncommon that. before, right? It was, and that yeah. was actually one of the the cards that got moved up. Moved up, yeah. But what, where I tend to look aren't at the rares and even the the big payoffs. I want to make sure that once I'm established that there are payoffs for this type of strategy. I want to look at the cards that are going to fill in the rest and see how good or bad those are because that often is going to be the difference between whether this deck is awesome or not. And it looks like the supporting cast is pretty good. You mentioned the two mana accelerators and even some of the more mediocre cards like Thornwield Archer is one in a green for a 2-1 reach death touch elf archer. Like that's solid, right? Like if that's your your crappy two drop elf that you just put in the deck, like that thing can block, it can attack, it's got power and toughness and it gets pumped and, and cares about elves or whatever. If I see that as one of my, you know, lesser cards i'm think i'm in you know dead bridge shaman is another one that's in the set that's a you know more recent reprint um i think this deck looks pretty decent I, again this isn't really my gig like i don't think that i'm just gonna like jump in and yeah black green elves let's do it but i i don't i do think that this deck looks like it has the tools to be uh fairly powerful well else has two things going for it which i think are very good one is that a lot of people aren't going to take your cards mm. and that's true of some of the other decks too, like like the Green White Enchantment deck. No one wants any of these cards, but the 
when you're looking at like the blue black deck or even the red green deck, like aside from Kurt Ape, a lot of the cards in the red green deck are just good cards. Burn spells, Rancor, these are cards that people aren't passing, you know, the blue black deck. Like no one's really passing a bunch of Necrotals and Factor Fictions. Whereas elves, elves could get a Lissalana Scarblade like 13th pick. And I don't think yeah. that would be unreasonable. No, not at you all. You know, it, it, it can pick up a late Huntmaster. It can pick up uh, a, a, a late, uh, the Elvish Vanguard, the, the one one that gets plus plus one every play an elf. Like, mm. The, the, these are the kind of cards that you, you're, I think, you're going to have access to at a higher rate than other people are, are going to have access to their important cards. So that's one thing. The other is that Elves has mana acceleration. So even a Elf deck that's not as high in interaction as you would like can maybe curve out fast enough. Yes. Whereas I think some of these other decks, if they a bad version might just be too slow. Whereas a bad version of Elves that still has three Lantern Elves. Right now, <laughs> yeah, just like, uh, <laughs> you know, if the Black White deck it seems like a slow deck. Whereas if you have three Lenore Elves or two Elves and a Blight Soil Druid, then you can play your Huntmaster on turn three and you can play two Elves on turn four. Or you can curve into Elvish Vanguard plus two Elves. And the, these all just seem very plausible to me. And so the Elf deck actually looks pretty good. Okay. Um, next, we've got Red White Tokens, which uh, has a few different token makers. You get Raise the Alarm. So that's the one in a white instant that gives you two one one soldiers. Uh, Beetleback Chief is back. That card's very good. It's a... Uh, uh, two red red for a two two that brings two one one red goblins with it so you're getting a lot of power and toughness spread out over three creatures for out of one card young pyromancer i mean that, that you played that card in vsl like that that thing is a you know vintage playable card yeah uh, you know the two one for one and a red and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery you get a one one red elemental token i mentioned mog war marshal earlier for for spewing out a bunch of tokens and then you get some ways to capitalize on them. I, I think what has to be the premium one is intangible virtue. The one in a white enchantment creature tokens you control get plus one, plus one and have vigilance. That is insane. And then you get some maybe not quite as powerful ones, but, you know, I consider them payoffs. Orcish or a flame, which is three in a red uh, for an enchantment attacking creatures you control get plus one, plus oh. So it just allows you to maybe attack. Uh, with a big swarm, they, they, of they really should have just put the alpha version of Orcish or Flame. Wasn't in it the like set. Uh, two mana? Or it was something? misprinted as one in a red. Yeah, <laughs> it, it actually would be that would be fine. That, there, that right? would just be a fair card to. Yeah, play like Orcish or Flame is is very expensive. Yeah, um, you get there's a card called Battle Squadron, which is three red red for a star star flying goblin. Its power and toughness are e each equal to the number of creatures you control. So that might be a way to finish a game if your opponent stabilizes or whatever. And you know, there's there's like Rally the Peasants. Two and a white instant creatures you control get plus two plus so until end of turn, and then you can flash it back for two and a red. So it's in your colors and in and on theme. That's the kind of card that really most decks just don't want any any part of. Um, but but you could you could take advantage. There's even like squadron honk hawk is in the set, so you could just use it to you know basically chain together a bunch of bodies and take advantage of of aura flame and stuff like that. Um, Hard to say on this deck, right? I mean, this is the type of deck that could be very consistent and very very powerful, but it, you do need the right mix of token makers plus payoffs to make it work. Uh, if you don't get that mix, then making a bunch of tokens often isn't that great. If they play like two normal creatures, you just can't attack even if you have four or five tokens. Um, but if you get the payoffs, if you slam an intangible virtue, then things get completely out of hand. The thing that I, I really want to see out of this type of deck, Luis, is like, um, you know, things that make 1-1 one, one flyers, right? Like, I, I yeah, want to see the those. The flyers are cards. so much more important than yeah. non-flyers. So I, I'll probably, you know, raise the alarms a fine card. There's nothing wrong with it. But, you know, when, when you've got the the type of card that can, can spew out a bunch of 1-1 one, one flyers, that's that's what you really want. Hard to say how powerful it is, but the deck looks, you know, it could it's, be consistent and, and kill people. It's interesting because I'm not really liking the sound of most of these cards. Yeah, but, same. But they do seem like they combine well. And they, it has a little bit of what the elf deck had going on, which is, your your blue white flyers decks just not or your black white deck they're not going to want raise the alarm no one's taking that from you and rally the peasant certainly isn't going anywhere and intangible virtue I mean who else is going to want that yeah so totally. so you might end up in a spot where you just get all the cards you want and the deck just kills you on turn five or six a lot of the time which even for this format I think is decent I think so too um, yeah you, rally the peasants uh, also by the way an instant so if it comes down to it you can play it and then flash it back in the same turn and you don't need that many creatures to get through to make that lethal so. Keep an eye out for that, too. Uh, I think we have just the one more, right? Uh, yep. Yes. Last one is Blue Green Threshold. What is this deck all about? So Threshold is the uh, Odyssey mechanic of when you have seven cards in your graveyard, 
do it, do whatever. Like you've got, you know, Werebear, for example, one of the cards is quite good in this deck is a uh, one in a green for a one, one taps for a green mana. And when you have threshold, it has plus three, plus three. So it's a four, four. Ooh, yeah, that's a big so, bump. Wow. And, and Werebear is a fine card in other decks. Like your red, green beats deck is, I think going to play Werebear if you're, I think so too. Cause mm-hmm. two mana, one, one that taps for a green is just a playable magic card. But if you can reliably hit threshold by like turn four or five, then which this deck I believe can a good version of it, you end up with a two mana four four. I mean that's just a great card. Uh, Merfolk Looter is just the nuts in this deck, just like it is in all pretty much all the other decks. Uh, it's got these threshold cards that again other people aren't going to want. That's a, that's really a key here is you want cards that are good in your deck that no one else wants. But the downside is that when your deck doesn't fire, these cards are really bad. Yes. So you've got like Centaur Chieftain, uh, uh, three and a green for a three three, and then it if you have threshold it, or three three haste, and then if you have threshold, it gives everything else plus plus one and trample. So if you play this with with uh, threshold, it's a four four trample haste for four, and the rest of your team just got plus one plus one and trample. So that's which is completely insane for four. That's man. a huge payoff, yeah. and the fact that it's a four mana three three haste means it's not like too much of a miss by itself. Whereas then you have cards like Cephalon Sage, which is a three and a blue for a two three, and just no ability unless you have Threshold, in which case uh, it enters the battlefield and you draw three, then discard two, which is a pretty nice ability as well. It is, yeah. It's a little awkward, right? That that can't like get you to Threshold. You have to have no. It's, it's like it, a Threshold but... enabler that it doesn't happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. You get Nimble Manguise. Yeah, the one mana one one uh, uh, shroud, not hexproof, to be clear. Uh, <laughs> that yes. uh, it gets plus two plus two, and you have Threshold, a legacy staple, in fact. Yeah. Uh, now, the question I have, because I've never played a, a set with Threshold before, is do you put cards in your deck to, for lack of a better term, turbo Threshold? For example, Dream Twist, green, instant, target player puts, you know, mills uh, the top three cards, and it has flashback for one and a green. Screeching Scob is in the set, the 2-1 for one and a blue that uh, mills you for two when it enters the battlefield. Commune with the Gods, one and a green sorcery, reveal the top five cards of your library. You can put a creature or enchantment from among them in your hand, and then the rest go in your yard. I mean, you're putting five cards in the graveyard with Commune with the Gods on its own. Like, is it do you does threshold usually play out where like you want it as soon as possible and that's the maximum or is it like my cards are going to be better in the late game than yours? Most threshold decks are not going to be playing Dream Twist. Okay, it, it's that's just too too much. Like you you can't you don't really want to throw away a card to do that. A, a deck that has a lot of really really good threshold abilities might, but if you Dream Twist to enable your wear bear, you don't really actually get that far because you spent a whole card on it. Mm-hmm. Whereas cards like Commune with the Gods are perfect because as long as you have enough creatures, you didn't you're not down a card. You paid two mana and you got your card back with a little bit of selection, and you're five cards towards threshold, which is incredibly good. Okay. So it's kind of like you have to pick your battles here. Threshold looks pretty good to me because it does a good job of just filtering and drawing cards, which makes the deck a lot more consistent. Just if you have a if you have a good version of it, and when you when you have threshold on, your cards are are pretty awesome, and other people aren't taking them from you. Like, you have cards like Roar of the Worms. This is six and a green sorcery. Put a six, six worm into play. But it has flashback of three and a green. So a normal yeah. deck can't, just can't wow. put four this. four mana it, for a six, six, it, it, provided you could get that card in your yard? That's right. absurd. Like, like a red green deck or a green white deck can't put Roar of the Worm in their deck. Like, you're just not going to put a seven mana, six, six into your deck. But a good threshold deck that has, like, looters or communes that can de- get the card into their graveyard all of a sudden they have access to this four mana six, six that came with card advantage too. Cause when you loot and discard this, then you're up a card once you flash it back. Totally. So yeah, I can see some pretty nasty curves here, man. Nimble mongoose, I mean, were bear, some type of like hell dream it, it, twist. It, this, flashback. Has all, this has all the hits besides like wild mongrel of the yeah. original threshold deck that was good enough for constructed with just all commons and uncommons. Okay. Well, th- this is a deck that I think I'm the most excited to try out because I only I have had very limited experience with the, these type of with threshold before. Um, I remember we did get to play with some madness in whatever it was, Vintage Masters or something. So I got to play that deck, which was one that I had always heard about. Like BDM loves that deck, and and I had wanted to play it. But this is the first time that I'll be playing threshold outside of like random cube threshold cards or whatever. But like Nimble Mongoose, for example, is that is my kind of card, buddy. I mean. I, I do. I do have to warn you that 
people, in my experience from from drafting Odyssey, which is a long time ago now, people are, are probably better now, but in general, it's, it felt like people overestimated how often they would have threshold and how soon they would have threshold. Okay, so so like, that's a so warning. Card, so cards like Nimble Mongoose, for example, mm. like, yes, when you have threshold, it is great. One mana, three, three shroud. But a mediocre threshold deck, this is going to be a one mana, one one a lot of the time. So, okay, so here's my curve. Are yeah, you ready? Don't, I was just going to say, don't look uh-huh. at these threshold cards and just assume you have threshold. That's what people always do. So but what I, I want to do is I, I'm I will gonna, listen to your curve. I'm going to play Nimble Mongoose, Werebear, Turn three, Dream Twist, flash it back. I now have Threshold. Attack for seven. Then the next turn, I'm going to flash back Roar of the Worm. There we Did go. I do it? Yeah, you, you, you proved everything I said wrong. No, 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 no. That's not what I was trying to do. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> no, no, no. I just say like I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turbo, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turbo threshold people. That's what I'm gonna do. That's my game plan. <laughs> I have no idea if it's gonna work, but I'm, I, I'm definitely gonna try it because it seems so sweet. Uh, but that's really good to know that that threshold is harder to turn on than it seems. I think that people uh, consistently underrate how hard it is to get. Definitely that many cards in your graveyards, let alone any, you know, you, 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 you'll often see people, you know, think like, well, this card's just a straight up two for one. It's like, well, you don't always have a creature in your yard for say your grave digger on turn four or whatever, you know, and you can get it sometimes, but like threshold that, that seven is a lot of cards. It takes a while to get those in there. I, I, I am really curious to see how that but basically what it is, is that in a natural game of magic, you do not hit seven cards in your graveyard until a lot later than your assumption might be. Okay. You know, until you know, you're not talking turn six here. You're talking like turn closer to turn ten. Like, okay. Maybe a little earlier than that sometimes, but you have to actually work for it. So threshold is great. I think this deck's going to be good, but you have to work for it. Oh, and one other thing, right? Uh, that that comes up with threshold is that if you can do it at instant speed, like you get those bonuses right away, right? Like, right, it's right. A you can you trickiness can, there. You can sigh and say go with a werebear and they attack their 3-3 and you're like, all right, block and then use this instant to make my werebear now into a 4-4 because I have seven cards in my graveyard. All right, so I'm going to upgrade my scenario to turn three, attack <laughs> with both creatures. They both get blocked and then I dream twist flash. Oh, okay. There yeah. we go. That, that, that makes the most sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, one, so that does it for all of the color pairs. I did have one other concern, question, uh, curiosity that I haven't really been able to sort out for myself. I don't know if you had any sense for it yet, but – is there going to be a five color deck? Because we have seen that in modern masters pretty consistently. Where if you want, you know, you can get the the bobbles or whatever wayfarers, whatever the things were to 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 search up or ramp out different colors and play. You know, these sunburst cards that we've seen in in those sets and stuff. Are you getting any vibe here that that we're going to be able to do the the full five color thing? I'm, I'm really not. I mean, Civic Wayfinder is is certainly a good card, but mm. it's it's got a lot to carry here i a lot of the other yeah. fixers are just not five color fixers no. so that, that's i mean i guess abundant too. growth does help as well so two common five color fixers but one of them is a very high pick for other decks too i i i think you could play a three color deck you could maybe play a four color deck or a five color deck sometimes but i think for the most part you're we're going to be looking at two color decks here yeah that's a, uh, that's the vibe i got too and it, I guess the last thing too is to mention that there are some powerful gold cards in the set. I mean, there's a mm. there are enough powerful gold cards that sometimes they are going to shape the direction of your draft. But Good but they're not, yeah, they're not necessarily like I mean, if you open like a glare of subduel or a blood braid elf, like that's just a good reason to draft those two colors. So I I wouldn't mind going into a color pair because I opened a great gold card of that pair. Okay, set looks fun, man. Uh, I, I I've tended to like these sort of linear uh, reprint things. I think they've done a good job with them and they've held my attention. Uh, I'll be looking to draft it on Magic Online, I think primarily, and then, you know, get in my my live drafts when I can. Uh, it is it is a pricey set. I think they're like 10 bucks retail for a pack or something. So, you know, if you can get one in at your local game store and scrape that together, then, then you should definitely... Uh, check it out but i you know i don't view this as a type of set that people are just going to be drafting endlessly it's just too expensive yeah i my guess is that the people who like to play magic online and are into the set will draft it more than the people who draft it live but i think i think i i'm not sure we're all in on this on that scale I mean, we'll see but I, my guess is i'm going to draft this a bunch of times but we'll, we'll find out I, I hope i do all right that is going to do it for the show and the uh, eternal masters primer hopefully you have a 
Good time with the set. If you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. I want to remind you that this show is brought to you by Channel Fireball. Dot com. Make sure you check them out for, hey, Eternal Masters. If you want to get your friends together, that's a great way to do it. You can split the cost of a box and uh, and and get some Eternal Masters draft in, you know, with your with your group of uh, Magic friends. And uh, I, I find that to be uh, very very enjoyable. And, and Eternal Masters is kind of a cool occasion, I think, as well to have people come over uh, and, and draft it. You can check it out there at CFB. Um, if you want to find us. Uh, a little longer. If you want to get a hold of us for a little bit longer feedback, you can email us lr at lrcast.com and everything related to limited resources, including the YouTube channel. Luis, there's a new martial art blog cliff up. I, I, I watched it. Did you already watch it? You're I in did. it. I, I know. In fact, you unveiled the LS vlog in it. <laughs> we'll see about we, that. We all <laughs> eagerly await the first episode of, uh, of the, I think you said there's it's not, a... It's not 0%. <laughs> Okay. Oh, that's exciting. Just, just, so, just so we're clear. Yeah. Uh, but you can find all that stuff there. There's a link to the YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that there if you want to get updates. Um, I'm working on the next uh, depth check video for for LR. That's the ones where I break down the drafts in, in more detailed fashion. And you'll get updated automatically if you uh, subscribe on YouTube there. And, of course, our streams and all the other stuff at LRcast.com. Thanks, guys, for hanging out. And good luck with Eternal Masters. And hopefully you open some sweet rares. We'll see you next time. So, Marshall, do you loot? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> all right. All right. I, I'll get by this quickly because what I want to talk about is not the literal looter problem, but what I what I saw as a result of it, which I think is actually more interesting. Okay. So, to catch those up who have not seen really any magic social media for the past week. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's pretty much all the magic social media I've seen for the past week. <laughs> <laughs> I did kind of break it. Uh, you by did. Posting, the 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 long and short of it is I posted the scenario: Would you activate Merfolk Looter with the second best card in your deck in your hand? Mm -hmm. And the the cards I used an example were Lightning Blast in your in your hand. Your opponent is a Sarah Angel. You have a Control Magic in your deck, and it is apparently incredibly divisive. Uh, but you knew I, it. I know you knew it when you posted that stupid. <laughs> oh, thing. I know exactly what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's great. And here's uh, why. Let me tell you why I think it's great. Okay. Because. Uh, Again, I don't want to go into the actual answer of the of the question. I mean, it is to loot, and and, everyone, and you know everyone agrees. <laughs> well, they don't. But they don't. It is I'll, I'll put a link in the in the notes yeah. for people that have. I, I think it, yeah. I think the problem itself is interesting, but more interesting I found was the reaction. And one of the things that I thought was really cool is there was a thread on the LR cast subreddit about it, and almost everyone was like, "Yeah, of course you loot. Why would you not loot?" <laughs> and I thought that. I think that that the, the LR philosophy really shines through there, and, mm. and one of the, that was what I was, what impressed me so much is that the reasons that people give the main reason that it boils down to not loot is fear. People yes. are afraid of discarding a good card. They're afraid that they're going to draw control magic, be forced to discard lightning blast, and now they're going to feel terrible that they that, that they discarded, you know, a good card. And I think looking beyond fear, looking at you know numbers and win percentages. Uh, well, I guess win percentage is wrong because I, I don't want to bring that into it. But I, if you if you look at you know the position of the card, where the card could be in the deck, it's not any more likely to be the first card than the third card. And people are just so hung up on the drawback of discarding a good card yeah. that they let fear stop them. And I think that's super dangerous and super easy. And a lot of people fall into that trap. It, so I think that it's really interesting to look at plays like this and – don't make the play that makes you less likely to have a bad thing happen to you. Make the play that makes you more likely to win the game, which looting, I think, does. For sure. So it, I, I I, have found this to be – it's almost a litmus test of what kind of magic player are you. <laughs> I agree. I agree. It's I a mean, weird it really thing is. to say that, but that actually has been how I've seen that play out in the in the comments and on the and Twitter and stuff. Yeah, the, the the people who can't stomach the, the thought of discarding a good card, like saying like, I think this risk is too high, which – Again, you know, I don't want to debate the merits of each position. I, I'm firmly on the side of loot, but I, I think that seeing the people say that versus the people who are like, well, I'm just worried about I, – I just want to increase my overall chances of winning the game because that that is kind of what it boils down to. Again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it here, but I think that the biggest stumbling block I've seen for people when they talk about it is that they get hung up on the worst-case scenario, and you just can't do that. You, I think that doing that in, in, in Magic or Life – it is risky. There are there are times when the worst case scenario is so bad that you should you should avoid it.
but I, I don't believe this is one of those times. And I have just enjoyed the ensuing chaos that has come from. Oh, from I know you've got film. your value. Yeah, buddy. I, <laughs> so, I have too. Uh, you I, know, I, it, interesting to note, Luis, uh, I may have mentioned it, but, but limited resources episode three from October, 2009 is about looting. <laughs> and is in fact, always loot. Yes. And, 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 you know, that was, you know, this was Ryan, you know, taking – you mentioned it's sort of part of the LR philosophy, right, is like to look at things from an objective, uh, logical perspective rather than like an emotional, you know, fear-based perspective and stuff. And so, yeah, he he decided, you know, way back then that that was going to be our, our, our third episode of it. it. It is an important concept. It's not necessarily understanding actual looting because not not every set even has a looter in it, but the, the principles behind it, very, very important. Yeah, it's a uh, it, 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 it's it's the biggest problem facing magic in our day and age is, 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 is the looter problem. So I'm glad I'm glad we have all our top scientists on. I'll just say that. <laughs>